everyone welcome back to the channel thank you so much for your support in terms of subscribing liking the videos commenting and sharing this content with anyone who is in this field of study or anyone who finds it somehow useful or relatable to them i hope that this video finds you in good spirits given this pandemic i hope you are drinking vitamin c lemon water exercising learning a new language social distancing quarantining spending time with family um spending less time on social media and most importantly i hope you are taking the time to watch useful youtube videos that can help you save your degree well, today's video is about Marxism. This is Unit 4 in terms of the curriculum structure of Education Studies 1A at the University of Johannesburg specifically. But this video is going to be useful to anyone who encounters uh, Marxism as a theory at um, their university studies. Before we get into the content for today, I would like us to do a brief summary of the work that we have discussed um, previously during this semester earlier. I'm sure by now you have forgotten, you don't know where what fits. Um, so I think it's good that we do a quick um, rehash on the content so you can see how everything fits together. In terms of the summary then, on Unit 1, you will remember that we discussed the work of educational theorist and sociologist R.S. Peters. R.S. Peters was concerned about one question. What is education? He wanted to answer that question because he thought that there's things that are easy to define. We can quickly define a pen as an object that we use to write with, a pot as an object that we use to cook in, a house as a structure that we live in. But he found it difficult to describe or define education in a similar, straightforward way. He found that at the end, there are a number of processes that certify a person is educated. But we can't say that being educated or education is one specific thing. Thing. He then said that when we look at an educated person, we are not looking for one characteristic, but we're looking for a number of characteristics or uh, personality traits and even knowledge traits that this person will exhibit after being involved for a considerable amount of time in legitimate educational processes. So that's the conclusion that Peters came to. In Unit 2, we then studied the work of Devala, who is our professor at the University of Johannesburg, as well as his as, as well as his as well as his colleague, Mate Bula, um, they wrote about the aims and conceptions of education. Here, we were answering a different question. We were answering the question, what is the purpose of education? Why must we be educated? Why is there so much importance generally in society attached to education? You hear people like Nelson Mandela saying um, education is one of the most powerful tools with which we can change our societies. Why is this a thing? They give us three um, re reasons or rationalizations around the importance of education or the conceptualization of education. They give us the sociological understanding of education, the enlightenment understanding of education, as well as the institutionalization or institutionalized understanding of education, where education means different things in different ways. Firstly, it can be means to socialize you into society, um, tell you your roles, tell you what contribution you must make into society. Secondly, it can be an understood as, a, as something of institutional value, especially now with uh, degrees, um, diplomas, and such qualifications that you need to prove that you have been educated. And also, they talk about the enlightenment area of education, where we get educated not as a means to an end, but just as an end in and of itself, because we want to know, because we have a thirst for knowledge. In Unit 2, we found other theories as well that were concerning um, the control and administration of education. Here, we spoke about Plato, we spoke about Amy Gutman, we spoke about John Locke and John Stuart Mill. The question to answer was, who should control education? Is there one entity or one stakeholder that we should prioritize over the other where the control of education is, is concerned? Are we saying that we want, for instance, the government to completely control and monopolize education? Or do we say it is parents that should decide what education looks like for their children? Or is it the individuals themselves who are going to be educated who decide? Well, Amy Gutman says it shouldn't be any individual entity. In fact, it should be all these stakeholders involved and democratizing the process of controlling education. We see this in the education system in South Africa, where you have the RCL, which is the Learner Representative Council, where you have the SGB, which is the representative council for the parents, where you have the SMT, 
which is the school management team. So you can see that there is a way to democratize the process of controlling education or to give platforms to the individuals or stakeholders who are involved in the administration, the control and benefiting from education. So that's what we got roughly from unit two. Then we moved on to unit three, um, discussing the work of Stenhouse, answering the question, what is it that is put into the education curriculum? Who decides that we should learn mathematics, that we should learn English, that we should learn um, physical sciences, chemistry, all of that? He said that this information or this knowledge is not originating from the school or originating with the teachers. He said that what teachers are and what schools are, in fact, is distributors of, of information. This is to say that public traditions, which is the term that he coined, things that we usually call culture, are what determine what will be in the curriculum. So he says curriculum designers and curriculum pan planners look at public traditions, look at the values that society um, functions according to, looks at the information that societies deem as important and takes that particular knowledge and puts it into the curriculum, which is why it's important to learn subjects such as life orientation, arts and culture, mathematics, English, and so on, because this is what society generally uses to function um, in other ways in their different traditional contexts. But what schools do is that they formalize and they standardize this type of information such that everyone is learning the same thing, which is what Stenhouse thinks is good, that we are accessing a similar kind of content. Now that we have done the summary for the work that we did in the first term then, um, I would like us to delve into this unit, the fourth unit, the fourth unit into um, the Curriculum for Education Studies 1A, which was Marxism. Those who have encountered my teaching, probably in the tutorials or coming for consultation, will know that I am a person of context. I love history. I love giving you a contextual analysis of either the theorist or the era in which they wrote their work. Because what you will notice is that the body of work that theorists come with is motivated by the context that they find themselves in. Most of the time, they write their theories as a response to the challenge that they have seen in the societies that they function in, and they think that that type of solution that they then recommend in their theory will help the society to become better and to improve in terms of the problem that they have identified. So this is no different for Marx. Marx is a person who existed in a certain uh, period of time in history, saw certain problems and developed theories that he thinks will work. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a long-winded answer to three questions. The first question is, what is Marxism? The second question is, what do Marxists say about education and attainment? And the third question is, what are the strengths and weaknesses of Marxism? So, Marxism is a method or theory of social economic analysis which views capitalism as an inherently harmful economic system because it encourages class inequality while also alienating the worker. The theory is named after its main proponent, Karl Marx, who was born in 1818, just a century before the First World War ended, in a country we know today as Germany. He then died in 1883 after publishing famous writings such as the Communist Manifesto. His most famous words are, Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose except for your chains. These words might not mean anything to you right now, but I promise that at the end of this video, you'll understand exactly why Marx was calling workers of the world to unite and what he wanted to achieve with that union. So Marxism as a theory is based on a very, very simple premise. Marxism is based on the abhorrence or the hate of capitalism. Marx got frustrated about capitalism to the point of reminiscing about past non-capitalistic economic systems where societies were more better off. He writes about feudalism, for example, where a man worked for themselves while trading on a small scale to purchase from businesses around them other necessities. From activities that individuals did, such as making your own house in collaboration with your family, plowing the food that you eat, women making clothing that the, the family will wear, activities like this gave individuals a sense of purpose, something to live for, which is something that they couldn't get under capitalism because things shifted from you being able to produce all the things you needed to survive for yourself to having to seek for a job in the unsafe mines or the polluted factories in the cities that were being built around you. 
had to do the comparative between non-capitalistic economic systems which had existed in the past and compare this with capitalism which was on the rise during his time to see where human beings would be better off. The answer to him was very simple. Human beings were worse off under capitalism because they were stripped of the ability to own property and land, they were working in unsafe conditions, had to live in polluted cities, and had to lose their identity in trying to chase the next paycheck. What was worse is that the paycheck itself was not worth any of the suffering that human beings had to endure under factories and mines. So it meant that all the toiling, all the work, and all the sacrifices that workers did was for nothing. In fact, it was to enrich the property and landowners that existed at the time. So this is the justification that Marxists have then for why capitalism can't be a system that we live under or a system that we encourage. So now that we've had a discussion in depth about Marxism and the different factors that led to Marx being frustrated by capitalism in the first industrial revolution, the exploitation of people and the environment that was occurring at the time, we need to ask ourselves a very pertinent question. In fact, this is a question that we always need to ask ourselves when we are interrogating theories. What does it have to do with my line of work? I'm going to be a teacher. Why do I need to know about Marxism? Well, Marx says that the function of education in a capitalistic country or a capitalistic nation is to create workers and nothing else. This might answer your questions about why we don't learn things like business etiquette um, from a young age at primary school or high school. You hardly find people who are successful businessmen and women saying they learned to be successful in business because they went to school. In fact, people like Bill Gates, people like uh, Steve Jobs dropped out of university or college. These are individuals who found other avenues of learning about business outside of the mainstream education system. It means that the capitalistic system is consciously and deliberately removing information or education that can help people to become entrepreneurs or billionaires because it simply wouldn't work if everyone is a billionaire. That's not how capitalism works. The way capitalism works is there has to be two classes. There has to be the rich and there has to be the poor. The poor have to work in the companies of the rich so that they can keep those companies going, so that they can sustain the system of capitalism. So capitalism can never exist without inequality. So that brings us to the second question, where we're trying to figure out what Marxists think about education and attainment. And the answer to that is very simple. Simply put, Marxists do not trust the education systems that exist in the world over. Because we've said that it's very few countries in the world that do not practice capitalism. It means that whatever education system that exists is deliberately designed to reach the objectives of capitalism. Education currently encourages you to be an industrious worker, to be respecting your authorities, to thrive for promotion, to thrive to be more educated, and so on. That is important to keep the capitalistic society or system going, and huge corporations are able to benefit because they have a huge pool of qualified employees to, to choose from, and they are able then to use these employees to make their huge profits. Schools kill creativity, they insist on conformity, and offer indoctrination into capitalistic society. Children learn to accept authority in an unthinking fashion, and this is exactly the type of mindset that capitalists need. They need you to be unquestioning, to be uncritical, to, ju to just take things as they are. So before this video becomes too long, let us discuss the last question. What are the strengths and weaknesses of Marxism? I think this is very important for us as teachers because we want to know why we should know these types of theories. And the most important thing right now is to understand that schools and classrooms do not exist as objective places where learners are sent so that they can be enlightened and empowered. But there is an underlying objective that capitalistic societies are trying to achieve to produce qualified workers that will simply just maintain the system by being employees in certain companies. We want to be aware of that and we want to encourage critical thinking. We want to encourage our learners to look outside of the box, to try and pursue things like entrepreneurship and try to be more um, independent and innovative as opposed to what we've always had in the past. Secondly, um, Marxism recognizes conflicts of interest in schools and lastly as a strength it points out the inequalities of both opportunity and outcome in a system. There's three weaknesses that exist um, in Marxism as a theory. The first one being that it assumes that teachers are not aware of class dynamics and are all middle class agents. It basically says that teachers are playing a role also in trying to achieve those objectives of, of capitalism while this avoids the fact that teachers are also people who are trying to make a living, even though they can't be aware of the fact that capitalism um, is being driven through the schooling curriculum. Secondly, 
Um, Marxism dismisses the success of people due to education or its ability to empower and not always oppress. We need to be aware that particularly in places like Africa, you find that being educated, having a degree or having gone to school increases your chances of living a better life rather than if you were not educated. So in as much as education in a capitalistic society means that you are an employee, you are less likely to be um, independent or to be an entrepreneur or to be innovative. It also means that in poorer countries, such as African countries, education also gives you the opportunity to lift yourself and your family out of poverty. Lastly, um, Marxism overemphasizes class and ignores other structural inequalities such as ethnicity and gender. It means that Marx was blind to the idea that being female um, oppresses you, that being uh, black oppresses you. The only type of oppression that he recognized really was classism, was being poor. He didn't re realize that if you are poor and black and female and disabled, you are more likely to suffer than the average white, um, less privileged person. So I think those are some of the dynamics that we need to then add into the theory of oppression or Marxism or how the dynamics of classism play out in other um, aspects of life. So thank you so much for um, joining me today. I hope that this uh, video has been useful for you. I hope that you will comment if you have any further questions that you need to be clarified. And I would like you please to follow me on social media. I am Ruth Zanele Majazi on Facebook. I am at Zanele Majazi on Twitter. And I am at Z underscore Ruthie on Instagram. Please follow me, um, particularly because I'm still a contestant for a competition called One Day Leader. And currently I will need you to see those updates, see how I'm doing and how you can support me. Thank you so much. Until next time.